basically C.S. Lewis takes you through a discipleship program as you're watching the show. He's wow. he's posing a problem. He's giving you solutions to it that are eternal. And then watching people go through this. I mean, I have people walking away just weeping and saying, like, I just feel the spirit of God when I watch these shows. And I think it's it's really had to do with Lewis's work and then us having a group of people that are dedicated to not just entertaining you, but to really just breathing into your soul through these pieces. Um, and so when I was in that mission of writing it, I, what God was telling me, don't give up. It's going to be worth it. Even if I don't fully see the arts reclaimed for Christ in my lifetime, I've got to keep running and keep showing young people that it's worth it and to give their talents back to God and understanding that he had given me a gift. Even though my personality was to hide and to not be around people, um, my dad said something to me. He said, Nicole, self-consciousness is consciousness of self. And that's not humility, it's pride. Wow. And he said, you need to get over that because what the gift you have inside of you is to be given. It was given to you by God to give to others. And if you let your shy personality stop you, then, you know, so I still feel that shyness inside, like thinking about going to D.C. and, you know, meeting thousands of people. I feel the shyness, but I think that helps because I don't fall in love with the crowds or people. I just want to give the truth out in the most powerful way I can. And that's my gift. My gift is staging things and, and directing. So in this story, that's what happens. The boy Shasta, who's the main character, encounters Aslan throughout the story, but he doesn't know it. He meets a cat and it's Aslan. He meets this fierce lion and it's Aslan. He meets this really kind of kind looking lion and it's Aslan. So it's a really cool way to show the Lord and the way he meets us. Alright, welcome faith aficionados. My name is Beto Gudino, podcasting live from Costa Mesa, California. This show is brought to you by ChristianPodcast.com, the portal for faith aficionados only. Today, we are talking with Nicole Stratton, and I hope I said that right. <laughs> She's the director of The Horse and His Boy at the Museum of the Bible's World Stage Theater, which will be performing from January 20 to March 3rd. That's in 2023. And here we go. All right, Nicole, how are you doing? <laughs> Welcome to the show. Thank you so much. I'm excited. Awesome. Well, first, did I say that right, Nicole Stratton? Stratton? Right, yeah, Nicole Stratton, yes. Stratton, okay. So yeah, I have that right. <laughs> awesome. All right, so I'm super excited for this episode because we're going to talk about Narnia, which is a beloved, a beloved oh, oh. creation yeah, story. Whole world, yeah. <laughs> a whole world, right? So I yeah. love that. You know, I used to read a few of the, the books from C.S. Lewis. Uh, mm -hmm. so many of them but particularly the Narnia stories right and we saw the movies a few years ago that also came out and that is just so epic and I have so many questions as it relates to how do you even translate the sentiment of a book into a mm -hmm. play into a performance so somewhere along those lines but first of all Nicole this is what I want to do I want to go to the belief o meter to kick us okay. off so, are you ready? I'm ready. Okay, here we go. The belief-o-meter of today. It's inspired emoji. Okay, Nicole. So, tell us a little bit about why do you feel inspired when, when you talk about Narnia, when you talk about the horse and his boy? <laughs> Oh, man, that's a big question. You know, I feel inspired because these books obviously are written by C.S. Lewis. We all know C.S. Lewis's journey of going from an atheist all the way to a believer and then how he brings these stories to life. I'm inspired because they have messages of absolute hope, redemption. They are very epic to put on stage. So you have to be inspired with creativity to be able to translate them onto the stage. 
And um, Horseman's Boy particularly, I just love because it actually deals with the subject of not just of redemption of Shasta, who's the main character, but also of, I guess, suicide as well, because both children in the book are at the point where they would rather die than go through what they're about to go through. So, and then Narnia comes into the picture where they're both given the hope that Narnia is a place where they could go and have freedom. So I think that's why I'm inspired. I love doing the books. I love bringing them to life. And The Horse and His Boy is something that it never gets old because of those inspirational themes in it. That's that so good. To give a little bit of a <laughs> taste of why. Mm-hmm. You did. And that's so good. I love that. So I think, first of all, I want to ask like two questions because um, right before we were even talking on the show, you said that this show is coming to D.C., right? So it's not necessarily the Bible Belt, but D.C. is the home of the Museum of the Bible. So that oh, in itself... Yeah. It's epic already. So I guess my first question would be right along those lines. Like, what is the Museum of the Bible? Like, for starters, for people that don't even know, why does it yeah. matter? Where is that at? Like, what is that? Well, yeah, it's crazy. They actually built this five years ago. It is an absolutely gorgeous building. Um, it has six stories in it. And the theater that they've built inside it is um, on the fifth floor. It's called the World Stage Theater, like you said at the beginning. But the Museum of the Bible was built by... Um, men who really wanted to show the truth or as far as the actual historical background of the Bible, that it is the oldest, most incredible book. And it actually has history of where it came from and to study that out. And they want people to come into contact and with the transformative power of the Bible. And so you're going to see artifacts there. You're going to see incredible things they've got. I mean, this the story floor, if you haven't been to the Museum of the Bible, you've got to go there at least once to be able to see that floor alone. It goes through the whole history of the Old Testament, the New Testament. It's fantastic. But they've got a theater up there. And of course, I'm from South Carolina, so I hadn't been to the museum until we started talking about bringing the horse and his boy there. And so they got us up there. We saw their theater. It's gorgeous. And we are coming to bring Narnia there. And I think it's perfect because Lewis really wrote these books for people to get to know the Lord in a different way. It's not necessarily the Bible, but there's biblical truths throughout it as far as hope and redemption and all of the things that are in Narnia. So it's perfect to bring Narnia to the Bible Museum. And I think DC is going to be blown away with what we're about to do for them up there. So wow. as far as I know, nobody has ever toured or taken something mm -hmm. like this um, to DC. So It'll be the first for a lot of people. So I hope they come. So exciting. So exciting. I'm, I'm so happy for you and for the team and for this new adventure. And I think when, uh, I mean, to be in DC, I was almost like thinking about this, this paradox of some mm. sort of, of a formerly atheist. And now mm. his work is presented in in DC at the Museum of the Bible, right? So I think, you know, early in his career, maybe as a as an atheist, he would have never thought of something like that happening. And right mm -hmm. and of course he's 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 gone now. But yeah. even for the fans, right, to think of the the trajectory of his work and to mm -hmm. have this place. So tell me a little bit about that that um connection with the Museum of the Bible. Like how how is this maybe a bigger stage, a better stage, like a, a maybe a bigger spotlight for mm. Narnia and for the work that you're doing? You know, that's so great because so true. It's going to be a big, huge spotlight on the Narnia books. Like we've been doing the Narnia books at the Academy of Arts. That's our ministry down in Taylor, South Carolina. We've been doing that for a while. Um, didn't realize that no one had been putting these books on the stage before. As far as mm. a lot of people have done the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, like a smaller version We did that. Um, and then I wanted to do the other book. So we ended up doing the world premiere of Prince Caspian. No one had ever put it on the stage before. Um, after I put it on the stage, I realized why no one had ever put it on the stage before, because it's mm. hard. I mean, trees are fighting in the battle. Bridges are exploding. There's a lot of uh, special effects you have to do. And then we, after that, did the horseman's boy. Now, in the title is horse. So we have literally had to make horses um, <laughs> that the kids ride on the stage. So two horses are performing in this show. And the kids are riding them. So in South Carolina, it's been happening and the news has been spreading. People have been flying from all over the world to little Taylor, South Carolina to see these Narnia books. 
But now the fact that the books are now going to be taken up to D.C. on tour into a museum where, I mean, Steve Green, who owns Hobby Lobby, he was behind building the museum. Harry Hardgrave, who is the CEO there, Jerry Pattengale, all these men, they are they are incredible movers and shakers for the kingdom. And so for them to get behind this is absolutely huge for the Narnia fans. I mean, the Narnia fans are always looking out for the next movie or the next TV series, but now they get to see it full scale on the stage done with so much respect that, and and also the Horseman's Boy is not, is not one of those books that a lot of people are doing. So they get a really special treat. A lot of people say it's their favorite book. So mm. I think Lewis would be happy um, because <laughs> I think he'd also be shocked because again, like you said, his journey to be now being performed in the Museum of the Bible. But then also I think he would be shocked because he did not necessarily write these for the stage. So mm. when you see the show, you'll know why. It's it's quite epic. There's so much that goes into doing the tricks that he wrote in the books. But I think he would be proud of it because we have really tried to stay close to his work. And um, so, yeah, it's, I think he would be too because his stepson, C.S. Lewis, is the stepson of, of C.S. Lewis. This book is dedicated to Douglas Gresham, who is the stepson of C.S. Lewis. He's now over the Lewis um, estate and he vetted my script. So he he wow. said to me that Lewis would be really happy because he knew him well. And wow. uh, he lives on the island of Malta. He actually flew over from Malta to see our shows. So if anybody thinks it's too long of a drive or a flight to get to <laughs> D.C., <laughs> Mr. Gresham flew from Malta. So I think they can make it. Wow, that, that is so epic. That's such a cool story. And I can already feel the respect and the love that you have for the arts, but also for the work where it comes from, right? And, and especially, I think, from the heart that it comes from, which is C.S. Lewis, right? And and I would love, I mean, this is kind of like curiosity on my end, but what does it take, I mean, to put this on on a live stage? I mean, you're talking about live horses oh. and Like, how many people are involved in this? Like, how much money do you even put into this? Like, how do you even get the rights or the permission to say, uh, we got to do this? Tell me a little bit about those. Like, was that a challenge? Was that Oh, like my goodness. Well, the only reason we knew we could do The Horse and His Boy was because we had done Prince Caspian. That was a world premiere. I contacted the C.S. Lewis company to ask for a script because I wanted to do it. But they said no script existed. So they, I said, well, would you be willing to let me try my hand at a script? And they said, yeah, you'd have to vet it through us and everything. So I did. And that's how I met C.S. Lewis's stepson, because he started vetting my script and we started talking online. And in, if you're familiar with Prince Caspian, Caspian gets on his horse, Destro, and he rides away from the castle. So we actually built a horse puppet. Now, it's hard to say puppet because people think like puppets, mm. but this is an actual life-size horse that some a person like a man can get on and ride. Wow. Um, it's puppeted by three men. So there's two guys inside the horse and one guy puppeting the head. And so these two puppet horses actually were built because we built one puppet for Caspian and we said, hey, we can build horses. Let's build two more and try our hand at horse and his boy. So it takes so much. You've got to, if you can imagine two guys, they're puppeting the horse, but they're also carrying the weight of the person on them for a two, two hour show. Um, so that alone is difficult in on top of the horses. We have two lions puppets that that actually perform. One is Aslan, the lion, and then one is also Aslan. But he's he comes to Shasta in several different forms. Um, think about this in your life. When the Lord comes to you, he doesn't always come to you exactly the same way because you're going through something different. Maybe mm. he is more comforting. It's not that he wasn't comforting before, but he perceive you perceive him to be more comforting. Or sometimes, Jimmy, you perceive him to be sh stronger and he's fighting your battles, right? So in this story, that's what happens. The boy Shasta, who's the main character, encounters Aslan throughout the story, but he doesn't know it. He mm. meets a cat and it's Aslan. He meets this fierce lion and it's Aslan. He meets this really kind of kind looking lion and it's Aslan. So it's a really cool way to show the Lord and the way he meets us and our need. So we've got to build two lions. We had to build um, a raven and we had to build a cat and two horses. So there's five puppets in this show. So that alone is a challenge. I mean, so, and then on top of it, you've got tricks because in one of the sequences, the lion is chasing the two horses. He jumps off of a rock and scratches this girl's back. 
And then the boy, Shasta, in the middle of full out running, the horse is running. He gets on top of the horse and jumps off of the horse. And we have to do that kind of in slow motion. So it's wow. easy. It's easier to do it in a movie. How do you do that on stage? You got to mm. come and get tickets to see how we do it. So, <laughs> oh, I would love to go see it. Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. Wow. So those are some of the challenges. And then you were also telling me a little bit about the 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 story behind this book right like there's there's this story of oh, yeah. of a boy who who feels i think that's the part that's so relatable and maybe the part that maybe even in the entertainment industry we are missing a little bit i would say right yeah. uh, i have shows with my wife in spanish where we talk about all these movies we're watching and then honestly like my kids are watching these shows and then they get up and leave and they're like eh, it's not not that of a good story right <laughs> not much yeah. to it So, I mean, that's super sad, right? But it's it, stories are so important to us. And particularly yeah. this one, it's about a boy who felt like he was lost. He was nobody. And then he starts finding like, so tell me a little bit about that, that theme uh, oh, that man. runs through this, this story. Yeah. So this theme hits home to me because if anybody, and I think all of us have felt at times worthless and like, Like we aren't worth something. And the Lord is so amazing because he's showing us that we are worth the whole world. Like one soul is worth the whole world. And so Shasta is the main character. He thinks that he is alone. He thinks he's an only child. But what happened was, it's a long story, but basically he was separated at, um, as a baby. He was stolen. And so he has a twin brother that he doesn't know about. He's stolen and he's taken away and raised by this man who treats him horribly. He, he thinks he's a slave. He thinks he's nothing. Um, and so one night um, a, a soldier comes through and actually offers to buy Shasta. He wants to take him on as his slave. And he overhears his father bartering for him and realizes he's not really his father. He tells his story about how he found him in this boat. And so he's kind of just really dejected and he starts to wipe down and rub down the horse of the soldier. And he's talking to the horse, not thinking the horse could say anything. And he says, man, I wish I knew what your master was like, because he's about to buy me. And I don't want him to treat me terrible, but my life's already been terrible. And so in the middle of talking to this horse, he says, I wish you could speak and tell me about him. And the horse says, I can. And he starts talking to Shasta and Shasta realizes he's a talking horse from Narnia because in Narnia, the animals speak and he convinces Shasta to run away with him. So they start on this journey. So it's really a journey story of how you go from thinking that you're nothing into realizing that you're actually a prince, you're actually royalty. And so for us as Christians, you know, when we don't know the Lord, you're kind of floundering. You're trying to figure out where you, where you land, where are you? Why are we here? Um, so many people struggling for the meaning of life, even Shasta is ready to die before he gets sold. He doesn't want to live anymore. Same thing with the girl lead. There's a girl in this and she is about to be married off to a guy. Um, he's like 60 years old. She thinks he looks horrible and she doesn't want to marry him. So she goes into the woods and is about to kill herself when her horse speaks to her and says, don't do this. I can take you to a place in Narnia where they don't make women get married against their will. And so these two children are on this journey to Narnia. So Yeah, I feel like in the entertainment world, we can get so saturated with all of the grandeur of, you know, CGI and all the stuff that we see all the time. We're really missing the core element of what speaks to a human soul. And that is the story. I mean, and Lewis was a master at this. He was a master storyteller. And here you've got these two kids that are struggling with the, their identity. Um, Erebus is actually really rich. She's a snot. And so when she meets Shasta, she thinks he's a nobody. She treats him horrible. She's always calling him mm. the slave boy and all this stuff and basically wipe my feet kind of an attitude. Come to find out he's the prince of Arkenland, which is the sister country to Narnia. So at the end of the story, she really has to eat crow and <laughs> she learns humility through this. And um, so I just I love watching the kids learn the, the messages when we have children come to the Narnia shows they are riveted. I mean, the kids themselves, mm. they can't stop. And it's a two hour show. So we're not, we're not, you know, making it any easier for them. We're just mm. giving them the full book and the wow. kids just love it. And adults, you know, the same thing. So I think Lewis was really hit on something with the Chronicles of Narnia uh, series and it's timeless. Uh, that's why they're classics. So wow. it's fun to tell them. So sweet. I have such a wonderful story. So Uh, two things that are striking me right now as you talk is one is the topic of 
of suicide. That's mm. I feel like yeah. it's it's almost like making a resurgence. In some of my previous episodes, a uh, pastor was telling me some of the statistics on suicide and then how things have skyrocketed with the rise of social media and that and not oh, that yeah. it's necessarily so correlated, but there's some correlation that we can just skip. Uh, so there's something to that, right? And so tell me, I mean, a little bit about that that hope. Like, where do you see, where do you see maybe our our society feeling despair? Uh, where mm -hmm. do you see maybe that even the entertainment industry like feeling that despair? And and how is this bringing maybe light into that world, or where where are, where have you seen light come into this world that that really it's it's dark? Yeah, it is dark, and I think that's one of the reasons the Lord is taking us from South Carolina right now, which is actually the Bible Belt of the country, and shooting us into D.C. into this national platform because these stories speak to issues like that, and our our young people are dealing with a lot right now. There's so many different things, even through COVID. I mean, imagine for mm. them their whole lives changing, everything, the way you interact with people changing. And so for live theater, it's, I think it's even more powerful than movies because you're watching real people on that stage and it's never the same way twice. You're going to get a, a really live performance and you're watching these real young people go through actual struggles and then make the proper decision and then see how it affects them and how it transforms their lives. And basically C.S. Lewis takes you through a discipleship program as you're watching the show. He's, wow. he's posing a problem. He's giving you solutions to it that are eternal. And then watching people go through this. I mean, I have people walking away just weeping and saying, like, I just feel the spirit of God when I watch these shows. And I think it's it really has to do with Lewis's work and then us having a group of people that are dedicated to not just entertaining you, but to really just breathing into your soul through these pieces. Um, so I, I think it's needed. I was glad that it dealt with suicide because we have a ministry to young people. We've had a ministry for over 50 years and it, the kids struggle, even if it's not, if, if it's not suicide, it's anxiety and depression. And the only answers to that are found in the spirit of God and in the word of God. And they've got to get into the truths of the word of God. So Lewis puts those truths in a really creative way in the show. Um, and like you said, we're storytellers. God made us that way. He's a storyteller. So I think we we identify with stories. As they're watching Erebus, they're going, like, wow, I've been there before. I felt like that. Um, one of the things that Erebus has to learn, like I said, is humility. She gets her back scratched. Mm. Um and the reason she gets that is because in order to run away, she drugged her servant and her servant was beaten for it, for falling asleep and letting her escape. And so Aslan actually says, you needed to feel what it felt like to mm. have it done to you, what you did to your servant girl. And through that, she learns humility. And then Shasta has to learn that he's not what he thinks he is, which is the slave kid. He has to learn to have courage. And then, oh, I will tell you this, when I was writing this play, It was a ton of work. And when you get to the part when Shasta has to run to go um, warn King Loon, the hermit tells Shasta, you've got to run and you've got to keep running and you can't stop running. And I just started crying working on that part of the script because wow. the Lord was telling me, I can't stop running. We are on a mission to reclaim the arts for Christ. Oof. Our ministry is on a mission for that. And we want to show people that because we know the creator of the universe We should be the most creative beings and we should be not kind of lesser than Broadway or lesser than these other things. We should be more excellent. And on top of that, have humility in doing it because we know these gifts come from God. So when I'm on a mission like that, it's hard because, man, you're getting hit with all this stuff. And really, the world has so much money. They've got so, so many people behind them promoting them. So bravo to you for helping us promote because, you know, we as Christians have got to unite We've got to get together. We, If we get tired of the darkness, we've got to stop saying we're cursing it. We got to light candles. We got to come mm. together and we've got to light it and we've got to produce things that are so excellent they can't be ignored. And so when I was in that mission of writing it, I, what God was telling me, don't give up. It's going to be worth it. Even if I don't fully see the arts reclaimed for Christ in my lifetime, I've got to keep running and keep showing young people that it's worth it and to give their talents back to God. So, you know, that's our mission. Wow, that's so powerful. There's so much fire in what you just said. Um, and I love how you said we need to be excellent so that we can no longer be ignored. I mean, that resonates so much with me. 
And mm. also the fact when when you talk about the arts, I was thinking maybe maybe that's this connection with this podcast today because because I was thinking of that today and you know the the mm. the situation with my kids watching this show and being like eh, it's kind of boring it doesn't really have yeah. a purpose blah blah blah, and then I was thinking the real art like like the the if if God is the creator right if God is the ultimate yeah. artist like he made us with that capability. And I yes. feel like art should be should be what compels us. Art should be what moves us. Art should be powerful. And, yes. and the things we're watching right now are not. And that, I mean, the fact yep. that, that I understood that gave me so much hope. Because mm. then I think I understood, wow, it's up to us. Like you're saying, right? It's up to the believer. It's up to the person that's yes. connected to the creator to say, here's art that's relevant, that can speak, yes. that's excellent and i i mean bravo for what you're doing too because it's it's amazing and even to have that that sense of legacy to pass it on to the next generation that is so epic right and i think that's that's even maybe the the honor to c.s lewis in a mm, sense right yep. like you are still pursuing like these messages i mean that's so wonderful i would love to know a little bit of your story like it seems like it's super evident in your life that you have a relationship with Christ or with with mm. God or with the Lord like how do you get to that point like uh did you grow yeah. up in a church like how even 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 as i think of like today's day and age a lot of people are losing their faith are walking away yeah. so why are you still in it and passionate well you know I was blessed to be raised by parents who were really on fire for God and were not just kind of churchgoers. They were actively pursuing other ways of doing what God had blessed them. My dad was discovered as a young boy, as a boy soprano, and was given two television shows by the time he was nine years old. Wow. So he was singing on TV live, performing back in the day when they didn't record it. It was all live. and um, But his mom was super on fire for the Lord. And she didn't have anything but a fourth grade education. So I'll tell you this real quick. He got saved through an incredible evangelistic service and he dedicated his life to the Lord. And from that time on, dad never looked away, but he had abilities to write, to act, to sing. He loved to preach. So he wanted to create a ministry that could give all of his talents, not just preaching behind a pulpit, but he believed preaching was any type of proclaiming of truth. So I got raised by parents that were like, Let's go. And then they talked through truths with me to where we actually talk through what we believe, why we believe it. Um, it doesn't mean that I didn't have to go through a time of like, like even like with Lewis of like trying to understand for myself and the Lord meeting me. But what's cool is through my gift, the Lord really claimed my life for him because I was the shyest one of all of my sisters. There was four girls in my family. I was super shy. I didn't like being around people. Um, so funny now that I'm directing all the time and I'm in front of people all the time, but basically I went on the road to help my dad. He started the Academy of Arts Ministry, which is what my husband and I now run. He started that in 1971 before I was born and um, we grew up helping him. One of the aspects of our ministry is we go into Christian schools, homes groups, and we produce a full scale production in a week. I know that sounds crazy. But we bring all the sets, the costumes, the props, the makeup, everything. And in one week, we take those kids and we do an incredible production with them. Okay. We still do that today. Now, I went on the road with him and I watched my dad doing that. And I don't know if you've ever experienced this of somebody you really respected. Like it was my father. I mean, he was my dad. But then I saw him on the stage and he was directing and he was, I mean, he was incredible. So as I watched him, I started learning. And then he would say, oh, Nicole, I've got a phone call. Can you come up here and direct this scene? And I would start to direct. And then we would talk a lot on the road. And I actually started realizing I had a gift for it. And then I went through our college program and got my master's degree. And I've been directing ever since. And so the Lord just really met me, though, in an understanding that he had given me a gift. Even though my personality was to hide and to not be around people, um, my dad said something to me. He said, Nicole, self-consciousness is consciousness of self. And that's not humility. It's pride. Wow. And he said, you need to get over that because what the gift you have inside of you is to be given. It was given to you by God to give to others. And if you let your shy personality stop you, then, you know, so I still feel that shyness inside, like thinking about going to DC and, you know, meeting thousands of people. I feel the shyness, but I think that helps because I don't fall in love with the crowds or people. 
I just want to give the truth out in the most powerful way I can. And that's my gift. My gift is staging things and, and directing. And, um, so I think when we find, I think what's happening is these young people are going to church and they're just consuming all the time and think about food. If you, if you put something in and it just sits still the dead sea, my husband uses this illustration that it's so much is going in, but nothing is going out. And that's why the sea is dead. And I think if young people could start realizing they've got a gift inside of them and they got active to use it. I mean, I've been on my knees just at the end of my rope trying to do one of these productions and God has met me. And I meet him in these different points where I don't have the money. I don't have the resources. And he comes in and does this miracle for me. I mean, how can you deny his existence or his love for you personally when you're actively working with him? And I think if we could get our young people, not just attending church, but finding out what the gift that God had given them and igniting them, inspiring them, like our emoji, inspiring <laughs> them and giving them a way to use those gifts, then they would meet the Lord in a new and real way. Wow, that is that is so epic. So I'm I'm thinking, uh I mean, another like kind of curiosity question I want to ask you is 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 about the writing process. But before we get there, as you were talking, I, I can help but think of like the people involved, even even I'm thinking maybe younger actors and mm -hmm. and how by playing these roles, maybe their lives are changed. Maybe maybe they Goodness, they yes. see you know the spirit in a different light. I don't know. So tell me a little bit about like some stories that you see uh -huh. when with actors just playing the role and then their lives are changed, perhaps. Right. Oh my goodness. There okay, we're gonna have to do another six hour podcast for you to <laughs> these stories. All But right. I'm telling you, there's when you look at the cast that's going up to DC, I would say the majority of them, yeah. the majority of those casts have not only, you know, learned stuff at our ministry, they've gotten saved through our ministry through being in the productions and their lives transformed. The young man who's actually built the puppets and he's puppeting one of the heads, he's now our master puppeteer. He got expelled from his school for drugs, alcohol, you name it. And the Lord got a hold of him after he came into our theater and was in a play. And we asked him to come on our drama teams. He traveled on our drama teams. He got saved. Life completely turned around for God, got on fire for the Lord, married a girl. They're in our ministry now, and he's making all these puppets. He's literally anointed by the Lord to make this stuff. It's crazy what he can do. And um, I mean, so many different stories of young people. Um, a young man who is in our ministry, Sam Singleton, He, I wrote a play, and I wanted him in, in the production, but I was afraid he wouldn't even show up because his dad had left the home. They had five kids in their home. And the dad had left the family and he was sitting in the back of the theater, his ball cap down over his eyes, didn't want to see anybody. My husband said, give him the lead role. And I was wow. like, I can't give him the lead role. He won't even show up for rehearsals. And my husband said, no, that lead role actually goes through the, the journey of believing on Christ in the play. And he said, Sam needs to go through that. And so wow. I gave it to him. He went through that whole production. And at the end of the production um, that next year, he got saved. And now he's on staff with us. I mean, He can sing, he can act, he can do all these things he didn't know he could do. But the Lord, I mean, look at what the Lord did. He is a storyteller. Mm. Um, even at the Last Supper, that final message that he gives to his disciples, he gives it through drama. He actually portrays a servant and he puts on a costume. He picks up a prop, the, the basin, and he washes their feet. Our Lord could have done that by preaching. He could have done that by giving them a three-point outline, but he didn't. He portrayed it. And so there's something about storytelling mm. that grips the heart. And without somebody just even just shoving it down your throat, you are allowed to think and to experience and to feel. I think Lewis did that through the books as well. He doesn't shove it down your throat, but he offers it to you in such a powerful way that you can think about it and then make a decision. So, yeah, all of us have had our lives changed through this ministry. And um, I think that's what lights us up every day to get up and keep doing it for somebody else. Mm. Wow, that's beautiful. I love it. And so the, the, the question I had about writing, um, it's just so interesting to me, right? I'm, I'm kind of like ignorant when it comes to this um, type of um, art. But I mean, don't you just read the book and say, I'm going to play? I mean, what, what is the writing <laughs> process like? Do you need to replace words? Do you need to add words? Do you need to reimagine things? Like, mm. why is that hard work? I mean, I, I mean it's evidently hard work, but why? <laughs> I, I don't I, eliminate me, please. <laughs> well, I think it's a completely different form of storytelling. So uh, with a book, you're able to handle things that you can't handle on stage. For, for example, 
there are different arcs, different climaxes that are going to happen in a book than if you did it that way on a stage. So for example, on The Horse and His Boy, C.S. Lewis is really known for a lot of, he, all of a sudden he's telling you this backstory of this person. If I did the script exactly like the book, it would really drag in its momentum. I'd hit a climax and then I'd have a whole nother 30 minutes, 40 minutes to go in the show before we ended. So it's really, for me, I'm very careful about works. And I think that's why we've gained the respect and the followership of the Lewis fans is because I'm very true to the book. So I'm not doing a whole lot of writing of my own words per se, but I am, I'm taking the book. Well, there are some that I've had to do. So like in the prologue, it'll say this happened, but I've got to actually write scenes for that happening. So in the prologue, the two children are captured. One child is captured and the other is left. So that whole first prologue, when you come, that's me, but I have to make my writing sound like Lewis. I don't want you to be able to tell when I'm writing and when Lewis is writing. Mm. So there are times where I'm writing new dialogue and that has to be very carefully done. I've got to take inspiration from the narration of the book and then I'm reworking um, the show and the way I'm treating it. So let's say this, um, it could be pretty boring too, because in the book, they're just riding on the horses. They're walking on the horses, telling each other their stories. Mm. Well, that's not going to cut it on the stage or even in a film. It's just going to get really boring. Um, so like, let's say this, when Erebus starts telling her story, her story actually on the stage starts coming around her and you start seeing it and she goes in and out experiencing her mm. story in front of you. So I think in the first maybe 30 minutes, we have over 30 transitions that we're doing on the mm. stage. There's so much fluidity and moving and that takes you've got to think about that from the ground up, from the writing perspective, you've got to see how you're going to treat, how you're going to treat those different elements. So, wow. I mean, wow. it's, it's a lot. I enjoy it. I visualize things really well. So it's fun to look at the book and visualize how I'm going to tell that. Um, mm -hmm. So Erebus's story is fantastic, but it's a ton of work on stage. But once you see it, it doesn't look like a lot of work. Cause hopefully by the time it's just like this gorgeous mm. dance you're watching. Yeah. So, Wow. Um, I don't know if that helps at all. That it's helps writing. so much. Yeah, I think uh, I think what I'm getting is is uh, there's different ways to capture someone's imagination. So in order to capture someone's imagination from a book to a stage, you gotta think things differently, right? So yes. so I mean that's so beautiful because that's that's I almost want to raise my hand you and do. say and you gotta make sure you're hitting a climax. Like mm. that's why I'm, why I'm but you I can tell you're musical. And so if you think mm. about it like this, the whole play and even all the writing, it's like a song. Mm. So you're making sure and even Lewis's writing is very musical. So I'm getting in I'm falling into his musical meter, his rhythms. Mm. And so that's how sometimes um, um that's how sometimes my writing can kind of mix with his you've mm. got to make sure your meter and the rhythms and the melodies are similar to his so it's it's a fun journey but it yeah it sounds takes fun some imagination yeah. but i was almost going to say wouldn't you be able to write um i lost you a little bit oh, okay you said wouldn't you be able to what to write the rings of power <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> anyways that's a different story Well, well, Lewis and Tolkien were friends, so. Mm. That's right. All right. Yeah. yeah. So raise the They're hand next friends. time they say, hey, we're, we're thinking of somebody to write <laughs> uh, Rings of Power <laughs> anything, please. <laughs> I uh, know. <laughs> It was kind of hard. Ugh. I, I tell you what, though, we would love to be at the groundwork of writing for what Netflix is going to do with Narnia. I would love. I mm -hmm. hope they do it justice because I think they've got the rights to film the books mm. right now. So I've been a little bit like, oh, but I hope they have good have a good team together mm. and that they're really respectful to the books. Because, I mean, it's hard for fans when books aren't treated well and mm -hmm. it's kind of disappointing. You got a lot of hype. You're waiting for it. And then, you yeah. know, so that's actually why I said I would never direct the Narnia books. Initially, I mm. said that several years ago. I didn't want to direct them. I didn't want to touch them with a 10 foot pole because too many people love them. They're they're iconic. I feel the same thing about the Lord of the Rings stuff. It's like, man, if you're not going to do it well, just you'd rather not do it. Mm -hmm. Wow. But, well, maybe some of the writers will, will, or the people in charge of it from Netflix will come to DC and be inspired yes. and connect because <laughs> I think that's needed. Okay. So, uh, yeah, love this conversation. So I want to wrap it up with this, this idea of going back to the Museum of the Bible um, yep. and, and kind of thinking of, Why do you think the Bible for some people, maybe it's it's offensive, maybe even disappointing, 
maybe not as exciting as maybe reading a book or a story like the Narnia stories, right? But it's it's kind of based on the same the same idea of, of the Bible. Or where do you see the Bible? Um, how can we help people see the Bible in a better light, in a sense? Mm, yeah. Well, I think it is very difficult because the Bible is understood through the Spirit of God. You've got to actually, mm. you know, it's not something that you're going to just understand on your own. And you've got to be really seeking for the truth. And I don't know, the, the Word of God a lot of times is is talked about very boringly, unfortunately, behind mm. pulpits. And people wield the Word of God with their own agendas so they're taking the word of God and kind of using it as a mallet over people's heads instead of actually in introducing them to Jesus Christ, who the whole book is about to reveal him. And so I think first they've got to, I don't know, it's, that's why I love what our, our ministry does. Our ministry's motto is making the Bible come alive. And Ooh. we, we actually act out the Bible for people. And in, even in the back in the day, you think about right now, the literacy level, I mean, reading the word of God is difficult. So it's easier sometimes for people to see it acted out. Then they realize they're real people and they begin to be more interested in it um, instead of just kind of reading black marks on a page. And I think people need to, be, like even like Lewis, he was very opposed to the word of God at first. And then he had to slowly be introduced to it and understand that it's not um, really religion as much as it is a relationship with Christ. And once you understand that, I mean, unfortunately, a lot of horrible things have been done in the name of religion and the Bible. And it's not the spirit of the Lord. That's, mm. that's the enemy trying to use the word of God in his own purposes. So I think if people can put aside their prejudice, put aside, or even take the time to sit down and read it. But I think that's why the museum's having us is because they know some people are not going to sit down and just read the Bible. They aren't. Mm. It's a lot of work and it's going to take time. Um, but if they can come to see a show, and be excited and be interested and meet Christians and go, Hey, they're not terrible. They're not, you know, beating us over the head with everything. They are kind or they're, they're interesting. They're talented. They're creative. And then that becomes to, there's a little bit of a longing. There's a curiosity that's born in people and maybe they'd be more open to the next step. So I think it's step by step and it's really relationship based. I, I don't really love being like um, shoving things down people's throats, but I also would, I mean, for me, I have people start with John. I think John is an absolutely mm. incredible book. Um, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. I mean, that's just, it's gorgeous. And, mm -hmm. but a lot of people just, um, I think they need to take it a little bit slower. And I think the museum's really passionate about that. So I'm glad they're finding other ways to pull people in. Um, if you just went to the archival floor, you might think it's just really boring and kind of, but it's beautiful when you know the Lord, but I think they're trying to do other things as well to kind of introduce people to different things that the word of God has produced. Because honestly, like you said, Narnia was produced by Lewis and Lewis produced it because he was a believer. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. And that, I think that's a beautiful connection right there. And I'm excited for the Museum of the Bible being so new and bringing, yeah, five years, bringing the art back kind of in a yep. sense, right? And, and the beauty of that. And they're so. using Christians to do it. I mean, mm. and what's cool about the museum is they have not spared any expense. They have done everything just top notch. It's so well done and it's excellent. So it's cool to meet other Christians that are willing to do that kind of work um, mm. to make things excellent. Wow. Love that. All right. So this is what we're going to do to wrap the show okay. up. <laughs> okay. We're going to go through our five emojis. And we're going to start with blasphemous. So okay. in the type of work that you do, even in the arts, what is the most blasphemous idea, the worst idea that you can think of? I think the worst idea I could think of in the arts is that the arts are not a part of the nature of God. Wow, so good. The arts are created. I don't believe the arts are created. I think they are a part of the actual essence and nature of God, and that's why we have them. So to deny that, I think, is blasphemous. Love it. Next one is skeptical. What are you still maybe skeptical of, or where do you see skepticism played out? What am I skeptical? <laughs> hmm, I'm a little bit skeptical that Christians are willing to unite and put money behind things like this to make it happen. I'm a little skeptical of that, but I think if they are tired of 
the darkness long enough, they'll be willing to unite together to make things happen that can penetrate it. Oof, that's so good. And get your checkbooks out. Okay. That's right. um, next one is inspired emoji. And this that's kind of what we've been talking about all along. So to summarize, where do you see inspiration or what inspires you? I love showing who Jesus Christ is through the things he's created and through us as his image bearers. I love showing him through the arts. So that's one of my favorite things to do. It's part of him and I like showing it. Sweet. A holy idea. The holy idea that we are literally made in the image of God and that God can use that to speak himself into us and for us to understand him better. So a holy idea of the Lord is the word. I mean, let's let's just say this, that Jesus Christ is the word. That is a holy idea. So good. And lastly, the most divine idea that you can think of. I would say that's it. The Jesus being the word. He is the word, the Logos. Nice. Okay, my friends. Well, Nicole Stratton went from shy girl to being the director of The Horse and His Boy, which is going to be performing live at the Museum of the Bible's World Stage. That's so cool. So where can people go? To find more about this, I mean, do, you, do they go to the website of the Museum of the Bible? And what's yeah, next for you? The website, yep, the Museum of the Bible.net. And um, we also can see more about it on our website, thelogostheater.com. So, yep. Sweet. All right. Nanya's coming to DC. I <laughs> <laughs> love it. And that was our talk with director of the play The Horse and His Boy at the Museum of the Bible's World Stage Theater that's going to be performing from January 20 to March 3 in 2023 and beyond. So, faith aficionados, we hope you enjoyed this conversation. Make sure to like and subscribe. Share this episode with a friend. Give us a positive rating. I'll see you on the next one.